So good afternoon once again. Uh, my name is Rhoda Howard Hassman. I have uh, just retired from Wilfrid Laurier University after 13 years with a Canada Research Chair in International Human Rights, and I work on state food crimes. So today we are very privileged to have a talk by Peter Gray of Queen's University in Belfast, followed by a discussion by Mark McGowan at the University of uh, Toronto. So Peter Gray is acting director of the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's University of Belfast. He took his undergraduate and doctoral degrees at the University of Cambridge before holding research fellowships at the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's and at Downing College, Cambridge. He taught Irish and British history at the University of Southampton from 96 to 2005 before returning to Belfast to take up the positions of Professor of Modern Irish History and Director of Research in Irish and British History at Queen's <coughs> University, Belfast. He was Chair of the Royal Irish Academy's National Committee for the Historical Sciences from 2007 to 10, and is a member of the Editorial Board of Irish Historical Studies. He was head of the School of History and Anthropology from 2010 to 2015, and is currently acting director of the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's University, Belfast. His research specializes in the history of British-Irish relations between about 1800 and 1870, especially the political history of the Great Famine of 1845-50, and the politics of poverty and land in the 19th century. And that was a long introduction because he's a very ac accomplished person. So Peter, I invite you to proceed. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, for that introduction uh, and for the invitation to come and speak to this conference. Um, uh, I've had a long-standing interest in comparative famine uh, as well as in the one I specialize in, the Great Irish Famine of 1845 to 50. I'm very much looking forward to learning a lot about both uh, the Ukrainian famine and the Bengali famine in comparative perspective, particularly through the lens of uh, comparative colonial uh, structures and policy. Um, the title of my paper is, Was the Great Irish Famine a Colonial Famine? Now, at first sight, this might appear a redundant question, not least in the context of this conference dedicated to exploring comparative colonial contexts of modern famines. Nevertheless, in the case of the Great Irish Famine of the 1840s, it's a necessary question to pose, not least as the historical literature on the subject and the historiographical frames of reference to which it relates are to some extent conflicted. My purpose in this paper is not to provide a simple yes or no answer, but to investigate the ways in which the Irish famine experience of the 19th century can be construed as colonial and what the limitations on this might be. It's of course unquestionable uh, that Ireland had a long-standing colonial relationship with its nearest neighbour, uh, initially the Kingdom of England, which sought to extend its authority over the neighbouring island from the late 12th century. And laterally, the new composite state of Great Britain, which emerged in the early 17th century through the Union of Crowns of England and Scotland, and then was consolidated through the Anglo-Scottish Act of Union of 1707, which of course may be uh, now on the verge of, of breaking up. A geographically constrained medieval English colony on the east coast of Ireland was massively expanded and transformed by a series of wars, suppressed rebellions, land confiscations, and legal consolidation between the 1530s and the 1690s. And this process resulted not only in the projection of imperial authority from London over the whole island of Ireland, but the substantive, if never universal, replacement of both the Catholic indigenous and old colonial landowning elite by a new English and emphatically Protestant ascendancy of landowners, reinforced in the early 18th century, by a series of penal laws intended to induce further conversions and to keep Catholicism permanently subordinated politically and socially. To provide a garrison against insurrection and, and to revive an economy devastated by war and depopulation, plantations of English and Scottish Protestants were attempted in several regions of Ireland, although this only proved successful in terms of producing a demographic majority in the northeastern counties of Ulster closest to Scotland. A number of Irish historians, uh, Nicholas Canny most prominently, have drawn parallels between this early modern recolonization of Ireland and the British Atlantic colonial expansion that accompanied it. Similarly, from the late 17th century 
The Irish economy was formally subordinated to an English and later British mercantilist system that restricted its ability to export certain products, such as woolens, and uh, its entitlement to trade directly with colonies within the empire. And while these commercial restrictions did not ultimately inhibit the massive growth of Ireland's two major export commodities in the 18th century, manufactured linen, which was exempt from legislative uh, impediments, and animal products and grain crops, they were a source of political resentment in contemporary Ireland and of much debate in subsequent economic history. While thus apparently colonial in its political and economic relations with Great Britain and in its internal social structures as a consequence of plantation and the replacement of the indig indigenous landed elite, there were at the same time cer certain ambiguities. Over time, certain sections of this landed Protestant elite came to articulate patriot opposition to British policies that assumed or sought to enforce Ireland's continuing colonial and mercantile inferiority. And this assertion uh, uh, from it, its, own, its own landed uh, colonial elite of, its, of Ireland's non-colonial character, uh, they argued that Ireland was a, historically a sister kingdom rather than a colony of England. Uh, this assertion of Ireland's non-colonial character in the 18th century was polemical and directed against explicitly, explicitly colonial policy from London. But it was carried forward into the 19th century nationalist tradition combining with older Catholic traditions that also constructed Ireland as an ancient European kingdom, now seeking the restoration of its constitutional autonomy through what was initially called re the repeal, repeal of the Act of Union, uh, or home rule. The constitutional, the constitutional relationship between the two countries changed in 1800 with the passage of the Irish Act of Union which abolished the separate Irish Parliament, which dated from the 13th century, and transferred its representation to the newly enlarged Parliament of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. So in 1801, when this was enacted, Ireland thus became officially an integral, integral part of the metropolitan state, the only part of the British Empire to be thus incorporated. Following the Union, it lost its separate currency and exchequer, but retained a subordinate government in Dublin Castle although this continued to be appointed by uh, Westminster, by London, uh, and its own legal administration. Initially excluded from representation in the Union Parliament and from major offices under the Crown, uh, after a major political mobilization, uh, Irish Catholics, the majority population, uh, roughly 80% of the population, were politically emancipated in 1829, albeit within the constraints of a high property qualification for both franchise and admission to Parliament. So constitutionally then, by the time of the Great Famine, Ireland was a hybrid entity, a kingdom united within the imperial metropolis, the United Kingdom, but retaining the structural legacies of its previous colonial subordination and with a large and well-organized nationalist movement that rejected the, the legitimacy of that union and demanded the restoration of its political autonomy. So, after thus sketching the nature of Ireland's colonial, or perhaps better described by the mid-19th century as quasi-colonial nature of its constitutional relationships, uh, this only gets us so far. The question of the relationship between colonialism and the famine needs to be refined, and to do so, I'm going to break it down into a number of areas for investigation. First of all, the socioeconomic structures in existence by 1845, Secondly, the trigger mechanisms of famine within Ireland. And thirdly, the, the determinants of state response and the extent to which these embodied colonial mentalities and calculations or to what extent other ideological and pragmatic forces were in play. So to start with the socioeconomic structures and, and the historiographical debates surrounding them. There remains uh, a very lively debate within Irish, within Irish economic history as to the extent to which the legacies of the aggressive colonial policies, which I've just described, of the 17th and 18th centuries, created continuing socioeconomic structures, rendering Ireland particularly vulnerable to famine in the mid-19th century. While older nationalist readings attributed all weaknesses in the economy to colonialism and the denial of national autonomy or independence, Revisionist economic historians in Ireland from the 1960s set out to challenge this. Uh, Lewis Cullen, uh, uh, leading Irish economic historian at Trinity College Dublin, 
in his General Economic History of Modern Ireland, published in 1972, questioned this determinism and drew attention to growth sectors in the Irish economy and to its ability to exploit colonial opportunities, such as the trans transatlantic provision trade and later, later uh, colonial export markets and linens. And even after the economic shock shocks brought on by the end of the inflated wartime conditions, uh, at the end of the Great Napoleonic Wars in 1815, these historians, the revisionists, would stress the variegated nature of the pre-famine economy, not only in the successful industrialization of, of the northeast of the island, but in the modernization uh, of, of commercial agriculture in the east and the districts around Dublin. And one of, the, one of this revisionist group, my own colleague in Queens, Liam Kennedy, has been the most outspoken in rejecting the validity of any colonial or post-colonial frame of reference for interpreting the modern Irish past, observing that evidence for such a relationship, especially as it related to economic history, is at best elusive, despite, as he writes, the length of the Irish-English connection and the wealth of historical materials which might be used to support it. This rather sweeping rejection of uh, colonial interpretation of modern Irish uh, history appears to have been part of a, a wider reaction to the dominant, pla dominant place uh, acquired by the 1980s and 1990s of uh, or, uh, admittedly rather reductionist post-colonial models uh, which became widespread, widespread in Irish literary studies at the time and their application to contemporary political controversies, especially relating to the Northern Irish conflict. Uh, and indeed, the, uh, arguably, the Northern Irish conflict, which breaks out in 1969 uh, and lasts until 1998, fingers crossed, uh, doesn't revive again, um, does seem to have had a, a major uh, um, distorting effect on much of historical debate about the, particularly the controversial relationship between Ireland and Britain uh, over the previous centuries. More economic, sorry, more econometrically minded historians who have dominated Irish economic history since the 1980s, uh, prominent, most prominently the uh, American historian Joel Mockier and the uh, Irish historian Cormac O'Grada, have differed from the revisionists in some things, in robust, particularly in robustly rejecting any neo-Malthusian reading of Irish vulnerability in the early 19th century, but they've nevertheless tended also to avoid overt colonial models of explanation for the underlying causes of famine. Joel Mockier's seminal monograph, probably still the most important uh, economic analysis of early 19th century Ireland, Why Ireland Starved, published in 1983, restricts its frame of reference to the first half, uh, the first, uh, half century before 1845 and stresses such factors as entrepreneurial failure, the collapse of proto-industrialization, due to factory-based competition and limited capital formation as the causes of economic weakness, exacerbated by Ireland's status by the 1840s as a small open economy. His point of comparison in, in this analysis of Ireland is not uh, the British Empire or any part of it, uh, but uh, the, the small European, West European country of the Netherlands, which was the, uh, the, the, the focus of his initial economic history researches. In many ways, he shifts his economic uh, modeling, modeling from the Netherlands in his first book to Ireland in his second major book. O'Groda, for his part, characterizes the agricultural economy as underdeveloped in contrast to England and lowland Scotland, but not in comparison to most central, eastern, and southern uh, European regions. And he, indeed, he points out Ireland's indices for literacy, urbanization, and industrial employment were all above European averages in the early 1840s. His argument tends to stress the contingency of Irish socioeconomic vulnerability in this period and its concentration in certain districts and among uh, certain uh, classes of the laboring poor rather than identifying any elements of inevitability arising from either population pressure or colonialism. And at the same time, both, uh, Mock, both O'Grada and Mockier would, to a much greater extent than the, the previous generation of revisionists, identify state failure in response to the famine crisis as a serious causational factor in explaining mass excess mortality. And indeed, both are open, open to investigating the applicability of Amartya Sen's theory of entitlements related vulnerability to the Irish case. So there are significant differences between this generation of uh, ec econometric historians and the previous generation of revisionists. What they have in common is rejecting, if you like, any colonial model for ex explaining Ireland's vulnerability. 
Now, there are groups of scholars uh, who have more recently, really, I think, uh, in the last 10 years, sought to revive a more colonial mode, mode of explanation for famine causation in Ireland. Um, and particularly, there's a group of Irish historical geographer, geographers, including David Nally at Cambridge, whose recent book, uh, Human Encumbrances, attempts to apply the Foucauldian notion of colonial biopolitics to famine causation and response in 1840s Ireland. And the, the eminent uh, historical geographer, Willie Smith, at University College Cork, was central to the team which put together the, uh, one of the most important publications of the famine to appear in the, in the last decade, the Atlas of the Great Irish Famine in 2012. Uh, Willie Smith stresses the long durée, as he calls them, um, obviously uh, applying an analyst uh, point of references, reference, uh, stresses long durée structures of colonial governance in explaining the events of 1845 to 50. In the Atlas, both Smith and Nally trace these long, what they see as these long-term weaknesses in the economy to the early modern colonial period and the devastation of war and reconstruction of Ireland as an extractive agrarian producer tied to English demand. Both the established economic historians and political historians of British governance in the 1840s might quibble with the tendency towards uh, uh, perhaps reductionism and an assumption that certain policy agendas were inherently colonial in these interpretations, but I think they've, the, the historical geographers have provided us with a welcome uh, reintroduction to the debate of the, of the colonial uh, in understanding uh, the Great Irish Famine. I think we have a, a real debate now, whereas 10 years ago, we just simply didn't have a serious academic debate about. There's also a small group of Marxist uh, historians and sociologists uh, focused around uh, uh, Terence uh, McDonough in Galway, who have also sought, sought to reintroduce um, uh, the, the, the colonial and uh, colonial structures of uh, dependency theory, Marxist analysis as well, to, uh, to, to revive this, this debate. So I think that it's still very much alive. I want to turn now to trigger mechanisms, uh, trigger mechanis mechanisms leading to the onset and continuation of famine conditions in 1840s Ireland. The central role of the potato blight, fungal disease, Phytophthora infestans, in devastating the subsistence crop the subsistence crop uh, uh, forming the principal foodstuff of perhaps half the Irish population, the rural poor, rural poor in the 1840s. And the, the sustaining of this uh, disease over five consecutive harvest seasons, either directly or indirectly between 1845 and 1849, is not contested by those posing nationalist or post-colonial critiques. No one else, else is suggesting that there's an alternative trigger mechanism um, uh, behind the Great Irish Famine. For econometric historians, this was what they describe as, as the principal exogenous shock coming from outside the Irish uh, agri agricultural system, essentially unforeseeable and unpredictable, uh, that, that threw a vulnerable economic system and impoverished social groups within it into a catastrophic crisis. The scale of the blight's impact on agricultural production and on calorific availability was stressed initially by Austin Burke uh, back in a number of publications in the 1970s, and most tellingly by the American economic historian Peter Solar, uh, who's based at the Free University of Brussels, and in, in his article, The Great Famine Was No Ordinary Subsistence Crisis, uh, published in 1989, which makes a strong case for a real food availability decline in Ireland, uh, at least in the first two years of the famine, 1845 to 47. Now, identifying a clearly colonial dimension to this epiphenomenon of the potato blight is difficult, beyond highlighting the structural factor of the acute levels of potato dependency, which were potentially consequent on the subordination of the Irish agrarian economy to British demand for imported grain. Rather than contest the blight as the harbinger of famine, both nationalists and those seeking to trace a colonial interpretation of causation for mass mortality and associated radical social restructuring in Ireland have focused on government response to, uh, to the crisis triggered by the blight rather than the disease itself. At its most extreme, as, a uh, as articulated by the exiled revolutionary nationalist John Mitchell in 1860 and echoed by his followers ever since, the Almighty indeed sent the potato blight but the English created the famine. This Mitchellite interpretation posited both a, gen a genocidal intent on the part of the state and a mechanism for bringing it about, the forced export of the alleged superabundance of other foodstuffs produced in Ireland that, had they been retained, according to this theory, would have been sufficient to prevent famine. 
And although, although this interpretation remains resilient in popular historical writing, both in Ireland and perhaps even more so in the Irish diaspora through to the present, the economic case for it has been undermined through painstaking analysis of both export-import patterns and the calorific value of foodstuffs available to Ireland in the later years of the 1840s, again by, by Peter Solar in his work. This does not, however, preclude an investigation into the ideological preoccupations underpinning food policy in the later 1840s and the possibility that some retention of exported surplus, if accompanied by an effective distribution policy, could not have made a significant difference in mortality rates, especially during the hunger winter of 1846 to 47. Within more solidly grounded historical writing, the debate over famine policy, its motivations, and its consequences continues to veer between, on one side, the argument for a coherent and rigorously pursued ideological agenda of colonial biopolitics, as proposed by Nally, uh, or uh, a, 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 an anti-Irish agenda proposed from a more nationalist perspective by historians like Christine Keneally. And on the other side, neoliberal apologias for the government and its operatives offered by Robin Haynes, in her tome on the Treasury Administrator, Charles Trevelyan, uh, published in 2004, and more recently, the attribution of government failure almost entirely to the external constraints set by the London money markets in a period of fiscal crisis, uh, published this year in the Economic History Review by Charles Reed. So we have a, you know, a kind of polarity here between entirely uh, a kind of a colonial or colonial related uh, policy agenda on the, on the, on the other side, uh, a, a kind of neoliberal uh, uh, apologia for, for government policy. Now, rather than give a detailed analysis of the literature on this complex and contested field, I'm going to summarize my own conclusions on the subject, having worked over this field uh, for several decades, with particular emphasis on the question uh, to what extent policy can be seen as colonial and in what ways. And firstly, and perhaps most importantly, it should be recalled that the government in office for most of the famine period, that is the British government, that headed by the Whig politician Lord John Russell, was a weak government with a minority in Parliament, internally factionalised and buffeted by genuine external crises, not just the potato blight, but uh, a very real fiscal crisis from the spring of 1847, followed by an industrial crisis in Britain, and of course European revolutions in 1848. This weakness rendered the administration particularly susceptible to shifts in articulated British public opinion, especially in the metropolis, and voiced through the, the major London newspapers. While at certain times, the press and middle class uh, public could express a remarkable degree of humanitarian concern for the plight of famine sufferers in Ireland, as manifested in the large amounts collected for charitable re relief collections, in early 1847. At other times, and increasingly as the famine lengthened, this could degenerate into anti antagonistic and sometimes racialized stereotyping, and an insistence that natural causes should take their effect in Ireland. So this conflict, these conflicting responses and swings of opinion are worthy of attention. But fundamentally, the collapse of sympathy for Ireland and the Irish was grounded in long-standing prejudices in England that rendered it too easy to other the Irish and to, de to deny any common British characteristics or entitlements uh, during the famine crisis. As the Prime Minister himself observed following the British general election in August 1847, it was very difficult to please England, Scotland and Ireland at the same time. We have, in the opinion of Great Britain, done too much for Ireland and have lost elections for doing so. Although evident uh, in uh, uh, leading articles, editorials in the Times newspaper um, and uh, political cartoons and publications such as Punch, overtly racialized language, well, as I say, it, it very clearly in existence in, uh, in certain uh, sectors of British public opinion, was, was relatively rarely employed in government, public and private discourses in the 1840s. In one of the few recorded occasions in which such language was employed uh, by the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, Lord Clarendon, the head of the British administration in Ireland, uh, uh, who wrote to the Prime Minister in August 1847, making an explicit colonial parallel. Uh, the, the Lord Lieutenant writes, Eskimo, 
uh, and New Zealanders, by which he means Maoris, are more thrifty and industrious than these people, the Irish, who deserve to be left to their fate instead of the hard-working people of England being taxed for their support. So this appears to be a, a kind of clear manifestation of racialized language towards the Ireland, Irish. Um, despite this outburst, however, Clarendon's subsequent interventions were to demand, largely fruitlessly, increased relief spending for Ireland and to denounce the mean-spiritedness spirit, of the English Treasury. Uh, it, it, he warned in late 1848 that the religion and charity of John Bull will in the end revolt against the deadly consequences of inaction and to condemn the, what he regarded as the penny-pinching policy of the British Treasury. Russell himself was a, uh, personally a weak prime minister, uh, that is, uh, in terms of his authority over his own government um, and parliament. But it seems clear that the center, and it seems clear the center of gravity in Irish famine policy from 1846 lay principally within the Treasury, the British Finance Department, headed administratively by the civil servant, Charles Edward Trevelyan, uh, who is, of course, the bete noire of so much popular historiography of the Irish famine, but also by his political superior, uh, Sir Charles Wood, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. The private and public correspondence and, and the publications of both of these men and their allies indicates a strong ideological drive that combined with elements of pragmatism at times to shape policy. Trevelyan himself was certainly conscious of the existence of racialized prejudice regarding Ireland in much of public opinion, but uh, it, it expressed his own dislike of the Times attacks on the racial deficiencies of the Celts and confided that I myself boast to be of Celtic origin. Indeed, Trevelyan is a Cornish, Cornish name, uh, therefore originally Celtic. I have always regarded the, the peculiar interest, with peculiar interest, the Celtic branch of our national family. However superior the German race may be in some points, I would not have Ireland Anglo-Saxon if I could. And it has always appeared to me that in the infinitely varied distribution of the rich gifts of providence, the Celtic race has no reason to complain of its share. So, I mean, that seems to be a countervailing, you know, sort of rejection of racialization, at least at face value on the part of Trevelyan. At the same time, he regularly and vehemently denounced the defective part of the national character of Ireland as the root social cause of the problem. So if the defective part of the national character is not based in a kind of Celtic racial construction, where does it lie? He connected it not to the Gaelic and Celtic origins of the bulk of the peasantry or to the Catholicism of the majority population, but to a spirit of dependency on the state and a reluctance to engage in self-help that infected Irish society. And while the peasant, in his view, needed to be educated in work discipline, the principal target of Trevelyan's invective, and arguably of the policy instruments he advocated and sought to control, were the nobility and gentry of Ireland, the class he regarded as morally and practically responsible for the underdeveloped and socially backward state of Irish society, and hence of its fatal potato dependency. The target group, this target group, also uh, popular as a target with much of British, British liberal opinion as expressed in the press, was of course overwhelmingly British and Anglo-Saxon in origin. A deeply religious man, Trevelyan sincerely believed that divine providence had intervened through the blight to bring a blessing to Ireland through revealing the corruption of its social and moral constitution and initiating a social revolution, as he described it, which would see the landowners either shoulder their legitimate burden under the pressure of state policy um, or be swept away themselves through bankruptcy and forced sales in uh, the, the newly created encumbered estates court. So this was the repeated refrain of his relentlessly optimistic apologia for government policy in Ireland, published as the Irish Crisis in early 1848. And I'd love to sort of read you a large chunk of the Irish Crisis, which is a kind of deeply ideologically loaded text, uh, but we just don't have time to do that, so I'm going to pass on. I've only got five minutes left, um, uh, towards conclusions. So Trevelyan's opinions were delusional, I think, uh, without too much risk of being challenged on that, both in terms of the political consequences of the famine and in seeking to impose a utopian liberal social transformation on a country prostrated by the destruction of the staple food of over half its population. 
It involved a transfer of responsibility for mass mortality from the state to the recalcitrant landlord class, while at the same time permitting that class to uproot from the soil hundreds of thousands of, the, of what it regarded as the surplus population of peasants through clearances in the later stages of the famine. Obsessed with imposing his vision of reconstructing Irish society in the name of national integration, and I've elsewhere characterized the dominant policy as amounting to an attempted capitalist cultural revolution in Ireland, Trevelyan and the government he served permitted hundreds of thousands who might otherwise have been saved by more interventionist relief policy to die as a consequence of neglect. For those of you who aren't familiar, the total number of excess deaths is roughly about 1.1 million out of a population of 8.5 million, which amounts to about 12% of the population over a five-year period. In addition to that, another million and a half emigrate, bringing the population down by about a quarter in five years. So in conclusion, we return to the question, to what extent was the Irish famine colonial? In terms of policy, the question was posed most starkly at the time by the conservative, later nationalist Irish politician Isaac Butt. Had the famine occurred at York rather than Cork, uh, he asked, would the government have responded in similar fashion? The implication in his view was, uh, was not. It's a counterfactual, of course. We don't know what would have happened had, had there been uh, a famine in Yorkshire as opposed to in Ireland. So no definitive answer can be given. Government policy towards the contemporaneous potato famine in the Scottish Highlands and islands, however, differed little from Irish policy, although the smaller scale of the crisis, proportionally much greater and long-lasting charitable transfers from Scottish industrial districts to impoverished rural districts, and the ability and willingness of Scottish landowners to comply with government demands that they feed, employ, and assist the emigration of their cotter tenants led to a quite different outcome in terms of mortality. Similarly, uh, government uh, indifference, uh, large-scale indifference to the consequences of the mass unemployment crisis in the early 1840s in the English and Scottish industrial cities and the imposition of the 1834 New English Poor Law with its emphasis on less eligibility were not dissimilar in many ways to the Irish uh, Poor Law policy in the later stages of the famine uh, and in similarly sparked widespread social resistance uh, in England and Scotland. However, what rendered Ireland different was the continuing colonial context in which policy was enacted and the continuing legacy of the deep social structures created by previous colonial practice, which I think were too easily readily dismissed as redundant by Trevelyan and by his allies. British working class radicals, for example, the Chartist movement, sought entry into the British political nation on equal terms, whereas Irish nationalists of whatever description who represent uh, the, the, the majority population within Ireland rejected the legitimacy of Ireland's incorporation into the Union and regarded it as emblematic of the country's continuing subordination. Whether, as has been uh, claimed, a self-governing Ireland would inevitably have dealt more effectively with the famine crisis uh, is again a counterfactual. Uh, there's a widespread argument that th that would indeed have been the case. However, there are other cases of self-governing countries dealing with famine crises in the 19th century, such as the Netherlands in the later 1840s and the autonomous Finnish government in 1867-68, which would seem to, to raise questions about that. On my final, final couple of sentences. So in this governing context, however, the continuing use of British military force to repress both revolutionary nationalist threats and agrarian social violence in the later 1840s, in this context, state policy could not but be construed as colonial in nature. Whether it was intended to be colonial or not, it is construed and understood through that frame of reference by Irish nationalists. Had that policy been benign, um, and to be fair, there are several episodes of relatively benign policy intervention in the later 1840s, but on the whole, it is not benign. Had that policy been benign, this might have passed unnoticed. But when those policies were denounced even by one of the government's senior administrators in 1849, as amounting to being policies leading to the extermination of the Irish people, it's inevitable that they should have been so inscribed in Irish memory. We might leave the last word to that official Edward Twistleton, who, in evidence to a parliamentary committee of inquiry in 1849, lamented that the country had failed to spare itself, that is, Britain had failed to spare itself, the deep disgrace of permitting any of our miserable fellow subjects to die of starvation, and went on to compare this uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, preoccupation with, with uh, expansionist imperial policy of how much less government 
of how much less permanent importance is the conquest of Sindh or the Punjab for the greatness of the empire so, uh, than the, the relief of Irish starvation. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Gray. I now in, will invite uh, Professor Mark McGowan to uh, present his comments. Professor McGowan is Professor of History here at University of Toronto and Principal Emeritus at St. Michael's College. He's currently the Senior Academic Advisor to the Dean of Arts and Sciences on International Matters. He has numerous publications on religious, migration, and cultural histories of Canada and Ireland. And his next book is entitled The Imperial Irish, Canada's Irish Catholics Fight the Great War, 1914-18 coming out in, with McGill Queen's University Press in 2017. Professor McGowan. Thank you. And I will continue my rigorous enforcement of time limits. Absolutely. <laughs> University administrators need that kind of direction. Uh, it wasn't that long ago I stood before this body and uh, uh, last year uh, and, uh, uh, and as a footnote to what Peter has offered you, uh, debunked uh, the genocidal theories uh, of the Irish famine. Um, what I'd like to do is, is just, first of all, praise Peter for what he's done, because in a very succinct form, he's, he's been able to bundle uh, a considerable historiography uh, that uh, is uh, very difficult sometimes to trap uh, in one place. And I think he's done a very credible job of doing that. And in particular, uh, the way in which he has contextualized the British responses to the famine within the context of other issues that the British government had to deal with at that time. Oftentimes in the nationalist historiography in Ireland, and particularly that generated in the United States, there is very little appreciation for the juggling, uh, and by, by no means am I sympathetic in many ways to the Russell government uh, as a historian or perhaps even as a participant at that time if I had been there, but what he's able to do is he's able to put the Russell Whig government in context, uh, within the context of a British fiscal crisis, generally within the context of the revolutions of 1848 on the continent of Europe, uh, within the context of long-standing racial stereotyping uh, of the Irish people and a long, deeply embedded uh, experience of anti-Catholicism uh, within uh, the United Kingdom. So I really appreciate what Peter has done in terms of bringing these strands together and in a sense, uh, building out from there to give us a greater appreciation uh, of the crisis uh, that was faced in the 1840s in Ireland. I'd like to add to that that I think even though the, the, the address and the paper come off as sounding somewhat speculative as to whether or not uh, we could label this a colonial approach to a famine, I think what Peter actually does when he talks about continuing, uh, continuing rather, colonialism, as I think he really begins to, to touch uh, the heart uh, of the matter in terms of the Irish famine. For example, even though the Act of Union, uh, consummated in 1801, had essentially bound Ireland uh, as part, an integral part of the United Kingdom, okay, the continuing legacy of colonialism really never leaves in a variety of ways. Okay, when you think of political control, okay, that political control is still held by Westminster, it is still held by an elite group, uh, not only an elite group who hold those seats at Westminster, but who are able to vote for that elite group. We still have a viceroy uh, in, in Ireland. And although Dublin Castle does have a certain degree of autonomy, this is still a dependent relationship upon the center. I think, secondly, we still have that legacy of socioeconomic structures that are still in place. Landlordism hasn't fled. It is still the principal landholding imprint on the Irish landscape. The subinfudation of that land is a continuing problem that is amplified by the destruction of the staple, the potato, in the 1840s. Uh, the low industrial development uh, that is commented on uh, by Moker in his studies is still relevant in this post-colonial environment, technically. One of the things that certainly hasn't been discussed adequately, and I think Peter begins to touch upon it, is the psychological imprint of colonialism. Not only the persistence 
of a psychology of a colonial relationship as held by the English towards the Irish, and uh, Peter has unpacked that quite nicely, but also uh, the memory of being colonized and being a colonized people on behalf of the Irish, which becomes a mainstay of Irish nationalist response. It becomes written into the collective memory of those within the diaspora, particularly those within the United States, who will then write the history through the lenses of a psychology of being a colonized people, and in many cases, a people uh, more sinned against than sinning. So let me take us out of that environment, because essentially, I'm a, a North American historian. Uh, who feels very much like a colonial going back and commenting on Ireland. But let's take a look at actual colonial societies, and it's good, I have five minutes, so I'll do the k version, <laughs> and the, which, is, which is even faster than what I've given you those out thus far. Let's take a look at actual colonial societies in British North America that were directly affected by famine in the same period, and let's take a look at the way in which those colonial societies dealt with Okay, the diaspora that's caused by uh, the famine uh, in Ireland. So the measure necessarily of the passage of a Canadian colony into a Canadian province is usually the acquisition of responsible government, which took place in British North America generally between 1848, beginning in Nova Scotia, right through to 1855 uh, in the former British colony of Newfoundland. And it's that principle whereby those selected for the cabinet come directly from those who hold the confidence in the legislative assembly. Okay, it's a principle that's still held in Canada today, that the majority party, as we might see it in our own vernacular, has the right to form the cabinet, not the governor in this particular case. So think of the colonies in British North America, and I'm going to use Nova Scotia because when the, the allusion to what have the British acted differently had it been in York? Well, what happened when there actually was the same famine taking place in the colony of Nova Scotia? One of those little known facts of Canadian history. In 1844 and 1845, Cape Breton and eastern Nova Scotia was de devastated by the same pastora infestans that attacked Ireland a year later. What did the colonial government, and in this case in 1844-45, which was not a responsible government, what was their response? And their response was immediate. Sir John Harvey, the governor of the colony, refused to take any immigrants from Ireland or anywhere else into the colony until the crisis was solved. Two, they immediately sent not only seed for the next year, but also uh, financial support to see the inhabitants over that hump. The one difference there is these are not necessarily Irish inhabitants, wherein that, that psychological uh, uh, barrier uh, seemed evident in England. These were Irish, these were Scots, and these were Mi'kmaq, First Nations people. The government of Nova Scotia at the time, as a colonial government, behaves very differently in terms of their response uh, to the famine. Again, it's localized. It's smaller scale, there's a mixed ethnicity, but nonetheless, this colonial government is able to respond quite expeditiously under those circumstances. So here's an interesting comparator to throw into the mix. The other is the, the government of the United Province of Canada, now virtually the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. A uh, population of about 3 million, facing 109,000 Irish famine migrants alone in 1847. Now, when you consider that in that year, 38,000 famine migrants land here in Toronto, which is a colonial town of about 20,000 people. There is still no responsible government here, but we now have legislatures that are forced to take action or to allow, essentially, people to die or move on to the United States. What these colonial governments do here in the province of Canada is, one, provide quarantine, which is grossly inadequate. That's a story in and of itself then provide medical and uh, physical assistance to migrants in each port of call, and then free transportation to move them into the interior and the opportunity to actually uh, engage uh, in agriculture because they didn't want them in the city. So here's yet another example of, this time, a colonial society, okay, in, in very much all respects, 
uh, uh, of a colonial society within the British Empire responding quite differently, okay, and expeditiously, I would add, uh, to, to famine circumstances within the empire. I think Peter's paper really is an excellent diving board uh, into this question, and I know he confided to me that he would have wanted to talk more about the colonies out in the diaspora, but that was wonderful because it gave me a chance to talk about them to you. So thank you very much. Could the organizers tell me uh, how long we have? Can we go till five minutes after two? Yes, is that fine? All right, I'm going to take my chair's prerogative, ask you to please go to the mics if you have comments. I will take up to four comments at a time. Questions and comments should be brief. I know this is an academic audience, but uh, it should be possible. So any questions or comments? And I encourage the so-called emerging scholars or people under the age of 50 to also <laughs> make comments. <laughs> Uh, add to the mic, please, uh, behind you. And please identify yourself. Hi there. I suppose it's the, probably the third person who works on the Irish famine in the room. Uh, I'm Emily Mark Fitzgerald from University College Dublin, and also someone who's worked on the famine for some time. Um, I just wanted to, I don't know, perhaps take issue a little bit with this notion of the collective memory and the sort of psychological dimension of that. Um, I, my feeling sometimes is that that term can be used as a sort of blanket term, which denies its kind of historical contingency, I think, as a phenomenon. Particularly, I suppose, as we see in the diaspora, the collective memory of the famine is often marshaled um, to create a kind of uh, legitimacy for certain interpretations of the famine past. Um, and I suppose in, it, it also tends to kind of overlook the very constructed nature of uh, memory discourses, which then, of course, are impact later on historiography, something which I think Peter has sort of uh, pointed out very effectively. If I could just ask Peter, though, if he might just say sort of a few words about, um, because you, were, you, you, you jumped from Mitchell, then further on into the historiography of the famine, starting from Malkir in the 1960s. But what about that in-between period? What about that kind of early 20th century in particular, you know, when you have um, uh, much of the debate happening over um, Irish independence? Where do we see then the sort of constructed discourse around the colonial premise of famine, how is that sort of being uh, taking place and being argued within uh, public discourse? So rather than kind of going to this notion that there is a universally shared memory or consciousness of the famine, which is something I think a lot of more recent famine hist uh, scholarship has tended to deny, or, or at least challenge in any case, um, but I think specifically kind of talking about the historiographical period, I'd be interested to hear what Peter has to say. Any other, I'll, I'll just see if there's any other, if you don't mind. Um, don't seem to be right now, so please go ahead, yeah. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Emily. I think uh, uh, Mark may want to come back about um, the psychological impact. Sure. Uh, might come back about the psychological context. Uh, I mean, obviously, I agree with you entirely that so much of particularly textual famine memory uh, is constructed through a series of, of interventions, I and mean, obviously the, the writings of, of John Mitchell, but many other Irish-American writers, indeed Irish writers in the second half of the 19th century, are crucial in, in articulating uh, a textual form of interpretation. But at the same time, I mean, we have to explain the reception uh, of that, uh, of that uh, corpus of literature. Um, I mean, it always seems to me, and again, Mark will, will have his own view on this, but it seems to me that there are, there are kind of two principal strands of famine memory uh, in Ireland and in the Irish diaspora, and they're quite distinct. In Ireland itself, particularly in rural Ireland, the memory is shaped very much by the, the kind of reconstruction of the rural community, of the rural village community after the catastrophe of famine. And the dominant form of, of, of memorial discourse is folklore, it's oral rather than written, and it's about locality. It's about you know, telling stories locally to make sense of this catastrophe, tapping into much longer term folklore traditions um, and you know, sort of uh, traditions of, of, of kind of um, mirac the miraculous provision of food to those who acted morally uh, you know, in, in relation to their, their needy neighbors and things like that. And also the kind of taboo nature of certain places where there, there were famine dead or where, where individuals were remembered as having acted in a kind of negative way towards their compatriots. Sure. Um, so I think that's one strand. The other strand is, is the diasporic one, diasporic in, in uh, Britain as well as in North America and in Australasia. And there you have you know, urban communities of people thrown together from many different villages 
villages and, and counties and different types. I mean, Ireland is very variegated. What do those people have in common? I mean, the, the, the locality is something they tend not to have in common, but the experience of having crossed the Atlantic uh, is what they have in common. The experience of hostility towards nativist, uh, in the face of nativist aggression and exclusion, discrimination is something they have in common. So in some ways, I think many of the, the cultural entrepreneurs like Mitchell giving shape to famine memory are as much addressing the kind of um, the need for a communal identity on the part of those, those diasporic communities as they're actually you know, talking about, about Ireland itself. Um, but so I think the, the psychological environment in which both those types of memories is being formed is quite is is, is important, but it's quite distinct and different. I know, Mark. No, I would agree, and Emily knows that I I poked and prodded at at collective memory and and the kind of generalization uh, to which she was alluded, uh, particularly through the way in which. Uh, monuments are, are are constructed to famine on, on this side of the Atlantic. I think I'm I'm probably more concerned about the way in which uh, that memory is then transmitted, particularly in the diaspora. And I would agree entirely with Peter because you have urban enclaves of Irish that are quite artificial in terms of uh, in terms of their origins. Uh, and in places, for example, in I'll use Canada as an example, so Montreal and Toronto uh, become really crucibles of a, of a variety of Irish from from a from essentially all counties uh, that that try to provide some sort of sense of badge of, of identity of themselves in Irish. I think it's more pronounced in Montreal than it is even in Toronto, where you have a dub double minority situation there, where Irish Catholics are part of a, a minority within the Catholic Church in Montreal, which is Francophone, and yet as a linguistic group, they're primarily uh, a minority uh, among the Anglophone Protestants of Montreal. The one thing they can hang on to is uh, the, the badge of Irish identity, and so they become quite receptive, and one of the most radicalized Irish communities on this subject in all of Canada. In Newfoundland, for example, uh, there's no sense of it because there was very little famine migration to Newfoundland. Uh, all of the migration there came from one part of Ireland, uh, that is the southeast, and so they identify their Irishness in a very different way. And, and I, one of my concerns is that, and I think it's similar to, to Emily's, is that uh, there's this blanket notion of a collective memory of the Irish. Well, it's, it's quite differentiated depending on, on where you are and upon you know, who's doing the speaking. The problem, I think, for some in the diaspora is that American Irish authors, historians, and popular writers, very much in the vein of Tim Pat Coogan, have, have grasped upon a certain idea which is then uncritically read uh, elsewhere through the lenses of, a, of another Irish community's history. So, I might just briefly come back on your well, other question, could, could anyway. I? So, which is, there's a second part to the question, so, which is about historiography. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, as you know, I've been working on the development of famine historiography in the decades after the famine. Not so much on what happens in the early, in the early 20th century. There is obviously a, a major step, a major shift of, of direction in 1956 in Irish historiography when the first major academic collection of essays on the Great Famine is published from a revisionist perspective, uh, the, uh, the, 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 Great, well, the Great Irish Famine uh, by um, Edwards and, and, and um, uh, Edwards and Williams. Um, there is a, there's a gap there. I'm hoping someone will give me a large research grant to go and mine investigate what's happening in that grant <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Please go to the mic. And identify yourself, please. Uh, so Kieran Fitzpatrick, Oxford University. Um, thanks for that, Peter. I was just, it always strikes me when uh, these subjects get raised that they are quite obviously political, um, political issues. Um, and I was struck when you were talking about the need to um, acknowledge the long-term colonial background to, to the famine in Ireland. That one of the ways you could do that is through the history of the family. Mm. Because what you get when you look at, say, Irish men who go imperial careering in the 19th century, is that a lot, a lot of them come from families who settled in Ireland um, in the, the 17th, especially the 17th century. And I wonder is if you can get a local perspective on um, famine in Ireland uh, 
um, that can be traced through through England, Scotland, and Ireland through the lenses of these these sort of colonial or imperial families. Just what you think about that? I think that's that's a really important question, Kieran. I don't have an answer to that um, at the moment. Um, I mean, one of the things, obviously, that's one of the one of the things that's happening in nineteenth-century Ireland is the opening up of imperial careers to middle-class peoples of, diff of, of individuals of different um, ethnic and religious backgrounds. So, by the end of the century, we have a significant number of Irish Catholic administrators throughout the empire. Obviously, um, Macdonald, who's the the um, uh, governor of Bengal, isn't he, in the uh, north northwest northwest provinces. Uh, in the 1890s is a classic example and returns this. So there's a kind of imperial diaspora and return in his case. He returns to be Under Secretary of Ireland uh, in, in uh, 1902. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. I think there's, there's, there's a lot we can, we can do by looking at these kind of imperial migrations. Charles Trevelyan, of course, uh, is another interesting example of someone who starts off as the education minister in the, in the, India gov in the Indian government in Calcutta in the 19th, 1830s, returns to be head of the treasury in 1839 and goes out again to be governor of Madras in 1860. 1860. Was there for, for two years. So yeah, I, mean, I think, I think there, there are really important dimensions that we can investigate. Any other comments or questions? Can it be from a comparative perspective too? I think. Uh, Frank Sisson, University of Alberta. Uh, in the 1930s, when the Ukrainian famine was occurring, one of the great problems for Ukrainians outside of Ukraine was how much to admit that their people had been brought low. That is, this, the, the movement struggling for Ukrainian independence in one way wanted to show the Soviet regime in a negative light, but they also were very fearful of saying, and they have basically won. They have destroyed the countryside and destroyed our potential base. I wonder if you could go more directly in the political development, that is, how much the colonial narrative and the struggle against the British shapes the, the uh, statements on the Irish famine. Uh, and is there also a, a guilt factor that we were unable to organize, we were unable to really save our people, uh, and does that play a role in sort of evolution of Irish political thought? Thank you very much. That's, that's a really interesting question. I think in some ways the, the, um, the trajectory in Ireland is, is, is quite different. Um, the Irish nationalist tradi tradition, particularly in the wake of John Mitchell's first book on, on the Great Famine in 1860, embraces uh, this interpretation of the Great Famine as being an act of, of genocidal policy by the British government, but locates Ireland's future salvation as lying in the, as lying in the diaspora. Of course, this is very much the message of, of the Fenian Brotherhood when it emerges after 1858, 59 as well. Ireland will be liberated through its diaspora returning to stimulate uh, nationalist feeling within Ireland itself. And that, I think, continues that tradition of giving the, the Great Famine quite a high role in nationalist discourse continues right the way through to the revolutionary period. The interesting thing is that it fades, uh, I, I said I, I didn't know much about the uh, period between um, uh, the start of the century and the 1950s, but in terms of public discourse, I think it is reasonable to say it fades to a significant amount, uh, particularly when you reach the kind of centenary period of the 1940s. There's relatively little public debate or discussion about the Great Famine within Ireland in the 1940s, because at that point, when it, Ireland does have self-government, but there are still problems of poverty, still problems of heavy, heavy emigration, when um, the kind of iconic nationalist leader, Raymond de Valera, who had been in the revolutionary generation and in, in, uh, been involved in the revolution in 1916, is the, the head of government in the 1940s and still can't resolve the profound economic problems facing Ireland. The utility of the Great Famine as a political, uh, you know, the political utility of recalling it fades very much. And it's not until really I think there's quite a different appropriation or interpretation of the memory of the Great Famine in the 1990s that it comes back into political discourse, again, in the context of, of kind of a, a construction of a, a outward facing Ireland that is that wants to pro project itself as, as being a moral force in, in, 
you know, global global development. We have experienced our famine. We can do something useful in terms of, of international development objectives. That's quite a different political uh, appropriation from what from uh, what had existed in the in the in the pre-independence nationalist period in the late think, 19th century. I think Mark would like to. Sure. I'll weigh in on the diasporic side since I, I Peter's done a, a really good job at looking at Ireland. So the diaspora is not one lump. It's very distinct uh, in terms of the way in which uh, Irish and uh, the descendants, as I'll call them, in places like Australia, the United States, Canada, Newfoundland, South Africa, uh, respond to this politically. Uh, the, the famine remains, and I think because of Mitchell and John Francis Maher and other writers in the United States, remains key uh, within uh, a narrative of, uh, of freeing Ireland and creating a republic, uh, and in some ways, much in the image of the republic that really didn't embrace Irish migrants uh, very kindly, uh, but certainly over time became uh, more of a, a, a counter uh, a program to uh, the British Empire. In Canada, it's very different. In the 1860s and 1870s, uh, the political discourse among the Irish is divided between physical force nationalists who would be more akin to those in the United States. There was a Fenian movement here, but the majority would have been constitutional nationalists who embraced the British system and said that if, if somehow Ireland evolved, okay, as Canada has as a dominion within the greater British Empire, uh, that is the better condition. Uh, and that's what, you know, that should be our vision, that should be our program. And that continues. The IRB remains strong in the United States well through into the 20th century. It does not remain strong except in isolated pockets and it go back to Montreal, the place where you'd expect to find the radicals, that's where you find the IRB people in 1916, but very few of them. So Canada uh, embraces John Red uh, they embrace Michael Collins's vision. Um, they are constitutional nationalists for the most part, and that's reflected somewhat in the book that I've just finished. Australia is an interesting case. If you read the work of Malcolm Campbell, Patrick O'Farrell, uh, Richard Reed, um, it's it's because the famine really didn't have a, an immediate strong impact on Australia, their responses to uh, things Irish and even Irish nationalism quite different. Uh, the famine doesn't become part of that narrative in Australia. And in fact, Australia is so physically far away, okay, that Irish nationalism in Australia waxes and wanes according to the issue and which nationalist politician from Ireland visits Australia at any given time. So I'll take one more question from this gentleman over here. Sure. So Peter, a question to you. You, you seem to be somewhat dismissive of counterfactual reasoning. And I, I wondered if that, if you, use counterfactual reasoning in your, in your work, and I want to suggest that maybe it could be useful. Uh, Marx provided a couple uh, comparative cases which I think are helpful, but the reason why counterfactuals might be useful are just for exactly the reason that the conservative politician that you mentioned, his counterfactual asks us to think about the role that identity would have played in this. And so there, there are some counterfactuals that are worth considering and, and allowing to play out in a, as a thought experiment. And so I'm, I'm curious to whether or not you see that as a useful exercise or not. We have one minute to ask this oh, question. Sure. Yeah, um, I, mean, a, a lot, I mean, obviously, um, counterfactual modeling is a kind of key tool, a heuristic tool that uh, econom econometric historians use. You know, so I'm very familiar with the utilization of that methodology in economic history. I think political historians uh, like myself tend to be a little bit more wary of doing it because, in a sense, we have a sense of the, of the multiplicity of potential forces at play and the difficulty of kind of isolating those and creating any kind of robust, in a sense, we, because we don't use statistics in the same way that the econometricians do, we feel, a little, I think, a little bit more hesitant in, in employing the uh, counterfactual methodology. Okay, so our next session is in five minutes, so I think in order to actually let you behave like human beings and move around for a few minutes, we should stop here. And thank you very much for an extremely interesting panel. Thank you.